so I, it's my pleasure today to have Gary Jones as our guest speaker. He's a historically significant speaker. You've all seen the beer commercial with the world's most interesting man. Well, that's not him. He's sitting right here. He's a true Renaissance man. His experiences are so vast we can't even tap them in, in a talk like this, but he's gonna, he's gonna give you a really nice talk and some historical information and some of his clients and the like. So um, we'll talk about the home he designed, his legacy home in Nighthawk. After he speaks, I'll get back up, give you a little hint. That is the lunch house. So we'll see you at the end of the tour also. Thank you. Mr. Gary Jones, Gary Jones International. My first order of business today, <coughs> excuse me, is to make a correction. An article appeared in Scottsdale Republic saying that I was a founder of Carefree. But other similar articles have appeared from time to time. I was not a founder of Carefree. I met KT Palmer and Tom Darlington in 1952, 65 years ago. I remodeled KT's original homestead at Pinnacle Peak and worked on Tom's home in Paradise Valley in 1953. KT and Tom asked me to come to Carefree in 1957, but I was not in any way a founder. I did the land planning for the original 1,400 acres of Carefree, laid out the roads and configured the lots. I wrote the original Carefree Architectural Guidelines and the Maricopa County Hillside Ordinance. Perhaps the real truth was that I was the only architectural designer naive enough to come 30 miles over a dirt track to design luxury homes <laughs> 65 years ago. I designed and built Carefree's first two homes in 1958. The first one was on lot 139 on Bloody Basin Road for Newey and Bill DeMille. And the second was on lot 178 on Long Rifle Road for Betty and KT Palmer. Not their last home, but the second to the last one. I did both of them. And I did the Darlington's home on Peaceful Place. In total, I guess I've designed and built about 140 homes in Carefree. The first lots went on sale in 1959. A two and a half acre improved lot on Black Mountain sold for $2,700. <laughs> That'd be about 850,000 today. I'm now in my 65th year of architectural design and I'm finishing house number 326 in Nighthawk. You will see it later today. I intend someday to write at least two books. The first would be titled, The Care and Feeding of Subcontractors. <laughs> and the second, 326 clients I have known. That last one, of course, would have to be published posthumously. But this morning, I can give you a few stories about some of my clients. One fall evening in 1968, Hugh and Ruth Downs and I were enjoying the sunset on a glass of wine on their south patio of their new home on Stagecoach Pass. Hugh was well known as the host of NBC's Today Show, and of course later as the host of ABC's 2020. As the sun fell behind Black Mountain, a large Greyhound tour bus pulled up at the base of the hill with a great wheeze of air brakes. We wondered what was going on. Then a bullhorn announced that this was the home of Hugh Downs, the host of New York's Today Show. As the bus waited, several tourists got off and one woman motioned for the driver to wait. This intrepid lady climbed up the hill across the desert, pulled her head over the top of the patio wall, 
and with a paper clutched in her hand, gasped, Oh, Mr. Downs. Hugh, gentleman that he is, smiled graciously, borrowed my pen, and autographed her paper. The woman tottered back down to the bus. As it pulled away with another great wheeze of air brakes, Hugh smiled and said, Gary, do you think we could post a small nameplate at the foot of the drive saying, E. Prentice? Well, for the next 15 years, Hugh and Ruth's home was marked with a discreet sign as belonging to the Prentice family, and the tour buses soon stopped coming by. <laughs> When I first arrived in Arizona, I did a great deal of technical mountain climbing. Vertical ascents with pitons, carabiners, ropes, and hand jamming. And long vertical descents with 3 8 inch rappel ropes. I put the first three bolt rappel station on top of the boulder pile, which lies next to the golden door in 1952 long before Carefree began. Those bolts are still there today. While designing Hugh and Ruth Downs' home in the 60s, Hugh became interested in my technical climbing, and I taught him to rappel on the Carefree boulder pile. We would climb up the south side and rappel down the vertical east side while my young daughter sat cross-legged on a boulder reading. <clears throat> Later, after Hugh became adept, we climbed many rock faces in Arizona. In 1968, we climbed the Nantac Rim in eastern Arizona and found three Anasazi cliff, cliff dwellings that were at that time unknown. We photographed that climb along with the cliff dwellings and it became a featured special on NBC television. We turned our data over to the University of Arizona in Tucson later. Tom and Iris Darlington had friends from all over the world. A few years after they moved into their home on Peaceful Place, which I designed and built, they received an unusual gift from a couple in Africa. It must have been about 1968, the era of Vietnam and the Beatles. The movie Born Free was popular, a feel-good film about lion cubs playing on the African savanna with their human friends. The Darlington's gift was hand-delivered in an open crate Inside was a two-month-old lion cub. Tom and Iris, startled with this gift, gamely decided to play along and tried to provide an appropriate name for this new addition to the family. Tom finally came up with Dandy Lion Darlington. <laughs> Everyone agreed that Dandy Lion was very cute. But Tom was a realist. They were bottle feeding a cub who was soon going to be a 500 pound lion. He would eat 50 pounds of meat a day, and Tom didn't want to be part of that diet. <laughs> for you trivia lovers, a lion's roar can be heard for six miles. Fortunately, Sam Mosier, another carefree investor, took Dandelion to a private zoo on his ranch near Santa Barbara. As far as I know, both Sam and Dandelion lived long and happy lives. I built two homes for KT Palmer and Betty Palmer over the years, and KT and I completed many joint ventures together on a handshake. KT observed the design and building of many of my carefree homes. He was an absolute bear about needless destruction of the desert. Every native cactus and Palo Verde tree was to remain, if at all possible. 
That's a real challenge in an area known for its lush desert growth. When I was building KT and Betty's final home on Stagecoach Pass in 1963, he arrived one day just as the bulldozer was trimming up the edges of the driveway. He heard me caution the operator not to remove any trees or cacti. I had told him before, but thought I should remind the operator once again now that KT was looking on. KT, saying nothing, retraced his steps to his car. He returned with a 22 caliber rifle. We were standing up on the main level of the construction site, watching the work continue. Hans Sutter, the bulldozer operator, made two more passes along the edge of the driveway, each one closer to a beautiful mesquite tree. I waved my hand at Hans to indicate that he needed to avoid the mesquite tree. On the third pass, KT, still completely silent, fired three shots into the dozer blade, which ricocheted off into the desert. That tree is still standing today. In 1968, Hugh Downs and I decided to design and build the first fly-in home in America. It was a joint venture project located between the Desert Forest Golf Course and the Carefree Airport. After completing construction, we furnished and decorated it in a most luxurious manner. The Carefree Development Corporation advertised it extensively as a fly-in luxury home. The attached hangar would accommodate a twin-engine aircraft, which could taxi directly from the runway to the house. On opening day, before a crowd of about 350 people, Hugh flew in, landed, and taxied up to the home hangar. We unloaded golf bags and walked into the home, which was open for wine and hors d'oeuvres. It was a great sensation and gathered publicity from across the nation. A few months later, it was sold to Earl Bartholomew. Earl didn't fly, didn't have an airplane, and was not a golfer. He loved that hangar, which he used as a shop for his engineering inventions. I did a home for Paul and Angel Harvey on lot 266 on Carefree Drive in 1968. We built a complete sound studio in his home, and Paul often broadcast nationwide from his home in Carefree during the winter months. Paul's full name was Paul Harvey Orant, and his voice was recognized nationwide for 50 years. Paul loved to walk. He was a great hiker. Each time he came to Carefree, his secretary would call me in advance so I could plan two or three 10-mile desert or mountain hikes during his visit. Paul knew that I was a Marine in World War II and Korea and had been wounded in action. I listened to Paul's nationwide newscast whenever possible. And during the Vietnam War, he often used the term light casualties. On his next trip to Carefree, while hiking on Elephant Butte, I raised my concern. I said that a man severely wounded in war does not think of himself as a light casualty, nor do his friends or his family think of him in that manner. Paul was quiet for some time and then finally said, light casualties is a term universally used by newscasters, but I can see it is a very poor one. In an action of 30 men, one casualty might be considered light. But that one man with his arm blown off does not think of it that way. 
I never heard Paul use that term again. Both Paul and his wife, Angel, are gone now, but their son, Paul Jr., carries on. I designed Alan and Lois Meyer's home in Carefree. Alan was from the Oscar Meyer Wiener family in Chicago. They were looking for a large site with outstanding views. I knew of a 20-acre parcel, very high on the east slope of Black Mountain, which still belonged to the Development Corporation. It was unimproved. This was in 1972. At that time, there was no road access of any kind to this site. It was a steep and strenuous climb from Stagecoach Pass. I had no idea whether the Myers were capable of making such a climb. Many of my eastern clients had rarely ever been off the pavement. But there was no other way to view this property. I described the land and pointed its boundaries out from below. They were most interested and said they would make the climb. It was in the early fall and not too hot. They arrived properly attired and we began the hike. I had walked up there many times and had carefully chosen the best possible route. After many rests, several minor falls, and lots of cactus extraction, we arrived. I found a comfortable spot, and we sat down to admire the view looking east. The first thing I saw was a very heavy dust storm coming quickly our way out of the southeast. I knew at once that my clients were in for a bad time. The storm was moving fast in our direction. I pointed it out and said that we should immediately find the best possible shelter from the wind and rain. I found an immense boulder which we huddled behind. The temperature had fallen 15 to 20 degrees in 10 minutes. The wind was rising quickly. In another five minutes, it was upon us. 40 or 50 mile wind, stifling dust and debris in the air. The wind was blowing choya cactus balls horizontally into Lois and Allen's arms and backs. Then came the lightning bolts and the downpour of rain through the dust, which became a mud storm and drenched all of us like drowned rats. At the storm's worst moment, over the shrieking wind, Lois held my arm and screamed into my ear, no sail. <laughs> we all laughed. After the storm had gone, I got them down the mountain. They bought the land and donated it to Maricopa County Mountain Preserve. I later designed and built their home on five acres in Carefree Highlands in 1973. <clears throat> Three of my early clients were involved in filming an internationally known movie in Carefree. It was directed by Michelangelo Antonioni. It was titled Zabriskie Point. Some of you may have seen it. Rod Taylor starred along with a cast of mostly naked juveniles. Zabriskie Point is a famous viewpoint in Death Valley. This 1970 film was what we would then have called a protest art film, or perhaps one could better describe it as a youthful protest against any human progress in favor of free love in a dry and extremely dusty setting. The movie was filmed in Carl and Via Hovgard's House on the Rocks, which is on Black Mountain on Stagecoach Pass. Carl was chairman of the board of the Research Institute of America in New York and an investor in the Carefree Development Corporation. K.T. Palmer and Rex Howard two of my clients, 
who developed the Spanish village on Ho-Hum Street, were cast as developers and had speaking parts. During this time, a well-known movie studio existed just north of the Target store, near Scottsdale Road and Ashler Hills Drive. Many Western movies were made there in the 1960s and 70s. It was called the Southwestern Studio and attracted many directors to our town. In the final scenes of Zabriskie Point, the Hovgard's house was shown blowing up in a fiery explosion. To achieve this without actually destroying the house, Antonioni built an accurate half-scale model of the front facade of the Hovgard residence. The model was located in the boulders north of the Southwestern Studios. If you look carefully there today, you can still see evidence of the explosion and black smoke on the granite boulders where the model was built and blown up. Another story about Carl and Via Hovgard's Home on the Rocks. One day in 1968, Carl invited me to his home for breakfast. We often had breakfast together, but always in a restaurant. Via had prepared blueberry pancakes along with the usual fare, all delicious. Suddenly, I was surprised to see a large gray rock squirrel run through the breakfast room about four or five feet from the table. Carl laughed and said, oh, that's Skipper, our squirrel. He comes through here every morning about this time. That's why we had breakfast here today. Carl wondered if I could find out how Skipper managed to get in and out. He was nearly the size of a house cat. I returned a few days later with lights and crawled in among the boulders that support the foundation. I found Skipper's entrance, but more importantly, I found that the builder had not properly drilled and anchored the foundation to the boulders under the building. We drilled the rock, placed steel, and pumped in $83,000 worth of gunite to stabilize the foundation. In 1968, $83,000 was a lot of money. Skipper had caused a very expensive breakfast. <laughs> Back in the old days, 1950s and 60s, we all looked forward to the annual steak fry at Big Brownie's ranch. Big Brownie and his wife, Goldie, ran cattle over 56,000 acres of his land. The ranch ran north and south from the Tonto National Forest to Bell Road, and east and west from the Verde River to Pima Road. The 8,000-acre D.C. ranch subdivision is a small part of Brown's Ranch. Part of the original 1,400 acres of Carefree was purchased from Big Brownie. <clears throat> there were no paved roads at that time in the North Valley, none whatsoever and the annual trek to Brownie's Steak Fry was often an eventful journey. It was usually held in April. The ranch headquarters was snuggled on the northwest side of Brown's Butte. That's the slanted top butte about 11 miles southeast of Carefree. You can see the butte from Scottsdale Road. In 1956, Brownie invited about 35 shakers and movers to his fry. Big Brownie was holding forth on the veranda in his favorite rocking chair. Goldie was bustling about with mint juleps and cracklings. The men were, dis were discussing cattle and feed prices while the ladies in diaphanous flower dresses and floppy sun hats walked out among the outbuildings. 
three of the ladies rounded a corner to see a small barn on fire. Horrified, they rushed screaming to Big Brownie on the veranda. Brownie, Brownie, the barn is on fire. Big Brownie took another pull on his gin and tonic and said, that's for the steaks. <laughs> Ross and Phoebe Slingman's home bridged an arroyo between two boulder outcroppings at the base of Black Mountain on Stagecoach Pass, next door to KT's last house. It was a revolutionary design and had won me another National Architectural Award. The Slingmans were quite proud of it. In 1974, the actor and director Orson Welles leased the house and invited film director John Huston to be his house guest. Ross wrote a strict lease that, among other things, called for no filming or photography of any kind. Ross and Phoebe intended to be out of town during the leasing period, so I agreed to keep an eye on their place. Within weeks, I observed Klieg lights on the patios, a sure sign that some sort of filming was taking place. Ross proceeded immediately to evict Wells for violating the lease. When Ross regained possession of the house, we walked through it together. A car had smashed through the front wall of the guest house. Priceless antiques and family heirlooms were floating in the swimming pool. Among them, an exquisite Louis XIV leather inlaid writing desk. Scraps of ham and eggs were lying in, in the beds amid obvious signs of pornographic film production. As Ross and I continued through the house, finding one disaster after another, I found several pairs of Orson's oversized underwear in a size 68 waist. Those of you who remember Orson will know that he was extremely obese in his later years. Ross and Phoebe worked hard to get the house back into pristine condition as quickly as possible. And soon it was hard to recall the damage. We never forgot Mr. Wells, though. Each year on the anniversary of his eviction, Ross ran a pair of Orson's gargantuan drawers <laughs> up the flagpole while we enjoyed a bottle of wine. <laughs> I still have 317 stories left, but my time is up. But I would like to say one final thing. KT had come to Arizona to die of tuberculosis in 1920 following the First World War. And Arizona's dry air had cured him. He graduated from the University of Arizona Law College in 1925. He homesteaded land on the west slope of Pinnacle Peak in 1933. In 1940, KT ran for Republican congressman unsuccessfully. In 1946, KT and Tom started the thought process which became carefree. By 1976, KT had been experiencing memory upsets and many strokes. On Wednesday evening, the 12th of May, 1976, KT drove out to his original homestead near Pinnacle Peak, carried a lawn chair with him, and sat down to watch his last Arizona sunset. He took his own life with an overdose of pills. KT was 77 years old. Thank you.